Trauma Healing and Prevention presents Vasilisa, a Slavic tale of wisdom. As all good stories begin, so does this one with. Once upon a time, there was a merchant who was not horribly rich and was not horribly poor, according to those who count coins. However, according to the merchant and his lovely wife, they were rich beyond measure with the love of their daughter, Vasilisa. Vasilisa was an inquisitive child, prone to asking lots of questions. She was also a loving child, gentle with the chickens when she collected their eggs, and sweet of voice when she would sing to her mother. Vasilisa's mother was well known for her own generosity of spirit, as well as her magical fingers upon the loom. But living was a harsh thing, and winters were cold. One winter, when Vasilisa was still a young child, her mother took to her bed with a cough. She asked Vasilisa to bring her wood and cloth, and the ailing mother fashioned a doll for her daughter. What are you making? Vasilisa queried. I'm making a doll for you to keep in your pocket. <coughs> answered Vasilisa's mother, followed by a cough that shook her frail body. Now, off to bed with you after you finish your supper. All night, the mother worked on the doll, for she knew her time was near. As the dim winter sun rose over the horizon, the mother finished the last stitches in the doll's dress. She bade her husband bring their daughter to her before he went to gather more wood for the fire. Once the mother and Vasilisa were alone in the mother's bedchamber, she invited Vasilisa up onto her bed. She carefully placed the doll into Vasilisa's much smaller hands. Vasilisa, <coughs> my dearest, I have made this little doll especially for you. It is very important that you give her a bit of her food when you eat. <coughs> give her a bit of her food when you eat. Keep her clean when you bathe, and never allow her to go thirsty. If you take good care of her, she will always be there when you need her. Promise me you will keep her in your pocket, and take good care of her always. Ask for her help any time you are in need. <coughs> I promise, Mama, with a quiver in her voice. If you feed her little bits and give her clean water to drink, she will answer your most important questions, Vasilisa, instructed the mother. Yes, Mama. I hear how tired you are. I'll gather breakfast for all of us, Mama. And off the bed she slid, going to make breakfast. Not many days later, Vasilisa's mother did not rise from her bed. Vasilisa's father was beside himself with grief. So Vasilisa turned to the doll her mother made her for comfort. She did as her mother had asked and shared her bread and water with the doll. And the doll comforted the young girl in return. As is the way, the sun continued to rise and set, and the seasons came and went. One late autumn day, the merchant returned home from his travels with a new wife and her two daughters. He believed his daughter needed a mother, and he knew that he needed adult company. So as the days grew shorter, the new family learned how to cohabitate. 
over the winter, the little house was full of people, but not quite as full of love as when the mother had been alive. The stepmother resented Vasilisa and how the townspeople and her father all doted on her. The stepmother soured her daughters on Vasilisa until the stepsisters resented Vasilisa because the chickens never pecked her, the goats never knocked her down, and the cattle never trampled her. The girls became sour and bitter. So when the stepsisters went to collect the eggs, the chickens would fly in their faces and peck at their eyes. When the stepsisters would go to milk the goat, the goat would kick over the pail and then headbutt the girls when they went to right the bucket. And while the cattle were small, neither stepsister was willing to get close enough to pick up the stitch like a cow herd. Whenever Vasilisa's father wasn't home, the stepmother and the stepsisters would expect Vasilisa to do all their chores for them, as they couldn't be bothered. When the stepmother didn't properly tend the fire and used up the entire wood pile, they expected Vasilisa to go into the forest to collect more wood for the fire. They were sadly disappointed each time Vasilisa returned with a fire bundle, as they, not so secretly, hoped she would be eaten by a wolf or be gored by a wild pig. Perhaps, they pondered, she would eventually be spirited away by a bear. Always, when the merchant came back from his travels, the stepmother and stepsisters would dote on the merchant and share treats with Vasilisa. Vasilisa, for her part, didn't want to ruin her father's happiness, so she never told of how she was treated when he was gone. She would simply ask if she was big enough yet to travel with him. One winter, the snows came early, and the merchant did not make it home before the route became impassable. The stepmother and the stepsisters, they conspired gleefully to finally be rid of Vasilisa for good. The stepmother told the girls to all go to bed, and she would tend the fire. Poor Vasilisa was so tired from chopping wood and doing laundry all day, she couldn't keep her eyes open and soon fell fast asleep on the floor near the fire. The stepmother and her daughters, they bundled up in their warmest clothes and covered up with their goose down blankets and curled up together in the stepmother's feather bed for the night. So warm and cozy they were, they quickly nodded off, and the little fire burnt itself out. Vasilisa dreamed of a world gone cold until she was violently shaken awake by her stepmother. You lazy girl! You let the fire go out! Now we shall all freeze! Vasilisa's teeth were chattering. The little cottage was so cold. Oh no! What shall we do? cried Vasilisa. We won't do anything, answered the stepmother. You let the fire go out, so you will have to go to Baba Yaga and ask for a coal to start the fire with, and pray don't offend her or she will eat you up. Then who will bring back the coal so that we don't freeze? As Vasilisa got ready to ask how she was to find the Baba Yaga, she felt the doll in her pocket give a little twitch. So she kept quiet. She dressed in her warmest clothes, wrapped her feet in her warmest wool wraps, and covered them with her tan portioning. She wrapped the crust of yesterday's bread in a corner of her shawl, covered her head, and went into the cold snow, her way lit by a sliver of moon making its way through the canopy of trees. Each time
time she approached a break in the forest, indicating the path was to diverge, Vasilisa would feed another crumb to her doll in her pocket. Once the doll finished eating, she would indicate whether Vasilisa was take the left path or the right. On through the snow, Vasilisa traveled as she crossed a wide meadow with a small brook whose frozen waters reflected the sparkling moonlight like a multifaceted mirror. Vasilisa was silently passed by a white horse with a rider dressed all in white upon his back. As Vasilisa crossed the book on a felled log, the little doll indicated, the sun began to make a weak appearance along the horizon. Vasilisa continued her journey, her tired little legs carrying her further and further away from the only place she had ever called home. She and the doll fell into a pattern. Vasilisa would walk and feed the little doll in her pocket small crumbs of bread, and each time the path diverged, the little doll would jump in one direction or the other, indicating which path Vasilisa was to take. Soon, a red horse silently passed her, ridden by a man dressed all in red, with red saddle, red harness and bridle, a red pack, and a red horse bow complete with a red quiver of red arrows. When Vasilisa next offered the doll bread, the little doll shook, indicating that Vasilisa must eat. As Vasilisa finished the last bit of crust, an odd building came into view. It appeared to be built on stilts, but upon further inspection, Vasilisa realized the stilts were actually chicken legs. The legs twirled and tilted and jumped and twisted, and Vasilisa was so fascinated by the odd little cottage atop the chicken legs, moving about the yard. She was nearly on top of the fence before she realized the fence was made of bones and skulls hung upon the tallest of the bones. Just as Vasilisa sharply sucked in her breath between her teeth, a black horse went racing past ridden by a rider dressed all in black, and everywhere the hooves touched down, sparks flew. Flying behind the horse, barely visible in the sky, rapidly going dark, was a giant mortar filled by an old woman steering with a pestle. Her hair flew every which way, her eyes glowed eerily like the moon, and while her body seemed tiny and wiry, her presence felt immensely overwhelming and as big as the earth. Vasilisa lifted her skirts to run, but flames erupted out of the skies of the skulls all along the fence, and Vasilisa was frozen with fear. So the Baba Yaga had no problem hoisting the young Vasilisa into her mortar and flying both of them down the chimney. What are you doing on my lands? cackled the Baba Yaga. I came to ask you for a coal to restart my family's fire, if you would be so kind, stuttered Vasilisa. Why should I care what happens to your family? crooned the Baba Yaga. If I don't take a coal back to restart the fire, my family would surely freeze to death, Vasilisa almost sobbed. Then I guess you shouldn't have let the fire go out, quipped the Baba Yaga with a sly glint to her eyes. I didn't let the fire go out, 
shouted back Vasilisa. I collected the wood, and I did the laundry, and I went to bed as I was told, and when I woke up, the fire was cold. Suddenly, Vasilisa was reminded by the doll's eerie stillness who she was speaking to and what she was capable of. Like eating children who yelled at her. <sighs> so, while I realize that you do not owe me anything, I am humbly asking if I may please borrow a coal to restart our fire. I will promptly bring it back to you, if you wish. She finished in a more repentant tone. You would willingly offer to come back here? A shocked Baba Yaga asked. If you would be kind enough to allow me to borrow a coal, I would gladly bring it back to you once my family's fire was lit. Baba Yaga threw back her head and chortled a surprisingly deep laugh. <laughs> Be careful what you offer, child, she wheezed out between cackles. You never know what may be required, as I can't give you something for nothing, and there is no way to ensure your return. You must do three tasks before I can entrust you with a coal. The Baba Yaga commanded Vasilisa to clean the house, clean the yard, and wash and mend all of her laundry. Then the Baba Yaga clapped her hands and multiple pairs of hands appeared out of thin air to set terrines of food upon a long trestle table. The food smelled delicious to Vasilisa, but before she could open her mouth to ask if she may have some, the little doll almost tore her pocket off with the force to get Vasilisa cleaning. The Baba Yaga ate her fill and then went off to bed. As she ducked through the opening to her private quarters, she casually spoke over her shoulder. Oh! And if you don't have the chores completed before I wake, I'll be eating you for breakfast. And don't wake me pestering me, or I might eat you anyway. With that dire threat, Vasilisa cleaned all the chicken manure out of the yard. Then she swept the yard clean of snow before proceeding to clean the house. As she grew more tired, her little doll jumped out of her pocket to polish the brass throughout the house to a brilliant sheen. Just as light began to peek over the horizon of the southern sky, Vasilisa finished washing the last piece of freshly darned laundry and hung it up to dry. Poor Vasilisa was so hungry and worn out, but she dare not wake the Baba Yaga. The tired, exhausted Vasilisa curled up by the warm fire and promptly fell asleep. It seemed no sooner had her eyes closed than Baba Yaga was shaking her awake. Is this some trick? Did you think to steal some fire from me while I slept? demanded the Baba Yaga. No! a terrified Vasilisa cried out. I completed the tasks for you and dared not wake you. I must have dozed off while I was waiting, she stuttered. If you finished in time to sleep, you either didn't do all I asked, or I didn't ask you for adequate tasks, snarled the Baba Yaga. The Baba Yaga went all through the house, getting more and more agitated as she couldn't find anything wrong. 
Even the brass knobs on her uppermost cabinets gleamed as they reflected the meager winter light. The Baba Yaga proceeded to go through the yard, stomping and stamping, and again couldn't find anything that hadn't been well cleaned or well swept or properly washed down. Even the laundry bucket was spotless, as was the water bowl and food trowel for the chickens. Fresh, clean straw had been spread throughout the chicken yard, and the eggs were each warm and spotless. Not a single speck of dirt was to be found where it didn't belong. Baba Yaga abruptly turned around, pointing at a pile of barley, and beside it a pile of what Vasilisa mistook for a small hill of dirt. Obviously, I underestimated your abilities, girl. This was too easy, so you haven't given me enough to warrant me trusting you with my coal, said the Baba Yaga. If you have the good fortune to finish separating the good barley from the molded barley, and then threshing it, and separate the poppy seeds from the dirt, and have them clean before I return, I will give you a coal to save your lazy family. With that, the Baba Yaga stepped into her mortar and flew away. Just before she disappeared out of sight, she reminded Vasilisa that if she failed the Baba Yaga, Vasilisa would be dinner tonight. Oh no, cried Vasilisa. However shall I finish these tasks before she returns? I'm tired and hungry, and each of these piles are more than twice as I am tall. And so a nearly defeated Vasilisa resolutely walked to her next set of tasks. The little doll in her pocket gave her a reassuring hug before clambering out of the pocket and over to the hill of dirt. The invisible hands appeared with baskets woven of hemp for the cleaned barley to be stored in, and clay jars for the poppy seeds. Vasilisa set upon the barley with a renewed vigor as the tiny doll was able to quickly and nimbly wipe each seed clean as she removed it from the dirt. So too, Vasilisa discovered her fingers were just the right size to quickly and efficiently pull the pearls of good barley out of their hulls, and before long, the discarded pile of chaff was twice as high as the original hill of barley. The tiny doll worked equally quickly, and soon all the clay jars were full of poppy seeds. In the weak winter's light, Vasilisa was able to more thoroughly examine her surroundings. The drapes over the windows and doors were in disrepair. A small family of shrews had set up home under the porch, up high on one of the chicken legs, and the rug in front of the fire had singe marks on it from tiny cinders that had escaped the fire. Not wanting the Baba Yaga to return and find her asleep again, Vasilisa asked the doll if they should repair the drapes and rug and clean out the shrews. The tiny doll agreed with the drapes and the rug, but shook violently over the family of shrews. So Vasilisa sat down to the spinning wheel and spun the finest threads as her mother had taught her, and she and the doll together repaired the drapes and the rug. As the last stitch was pulled tight, the little doll dropped her section of thread and jumped into Vasilisa's pocket, just as the Baba Yaga and her mortar flew down the chimney. I knew it, accused the Baba Yaga as she leapt out of her mortar. You are nothing but a slacker, and you and your family deserve to freeze to death. Here you are lazing at the fire instead of sorting my barley and poppy seeds as I directed. Oh no, Baba Yaga, I am not a slacker. I completed the tasks you set before me, 
and I saw that the drapes and the rug were in need of repair. I did not want you to catch cold from drafts through the holes in the drapes, and I did not want your feet to get chilblains from the cinder spots in the rug. So I repaired them for you. And with that, Vasilisa knotted her thread and handed the spindle to the Baba Yaga. The Baba Yaga knew the thread was not hers, for it was far finer and ran smooth between her rough fingers. Where did you get this child? She asked harshly. My, my mother taught me to spin the finest threads for her, to weave her beautiful cloth, Vasilisa answered and a small tear escaped from her right eye at the memory of her mother. If your mother can spin and weave so well, why did she act so foolish and let the fire go out? asked the Baba Yaga. Oh, my mother never let the fire go out, whispered Vasilisa. It, it was my stepmother who let the fire go out and sent me to you to ask for coal. Humph, said Baba Yaga. Well, you've completed my tasks, and I can find no fault with your work that would allow me to eat you for dinner. Before I send you home with your coal, is there anything you would like to know that you are brave enough to ask me? Hmm... As I traveled through the woods and across the steps to your house, I saw three riders, Baba Yaga. They were most peculiar and did not make a sound as they raced over the ground. The first was on a white horse, and the rider was dressed all in white, with even his saddle pack and weapons all of white. Next. I was silently passed by a red horse, and his rider was garbed all in red. Even the horse bow across his back gleamed of a red wood, and his quiver was made of red leather, and his arrows were fletched with red feathers. Finally, just before you flew in over the forest, a black rider on a black horse that threw sparks from Everywhere his hoofs landed, ran past me faster than an eagle flies. Who were those three riders on their three horses, Baba Yaga? The Baba Yaga cackled. I see you met day, sun, and night, the old woman chortled. And you managed to meet night and live to tell the tale. Are you sure that is all you wish to know? asked the Baba Yaga. Vasilisa's mouth opened to ask about the hands that mysteriously appeared to put away the poppy seeds and barley. But wisely listened to the doll and thanked Baba Yaga instead. So, how did you complete all my tasks and know not to offend me with foolish inquiries? inquired Baba Yaga. With my mother's blessing, answered the girl softly. Upon hearing Vasilisa's answer, Baba Yaga flew into a rage. Blessings! Blessings! There will be no blessings here! shouted Baba Yaga. And knowing better than to ever break her word to one protected by a mother's blessing, Baba Yaga grabbed a skull from atop her fence with iron tongs and nearly hurled them at Vasilisa. Go on with you and no need to bring them back! With that, the Baba Yaga whirled away and retreated into her home. Oh dear, muttered Vasilisa. It was hard enough to get here under the light of the waning moon, but now it is full dark. However will we find our way home? Vasilisa wondered. So with one hand holding the tongs tight, carrying the skull out in front, and her other hand resting on the doll for reassurance, Vasilisa and her tiny doll 
retraced their steps home in the full dark. Only the light emanating from the eyes of the skull prevented them from falling off the fallen tree over the stream or poking out an eye on a low-hanging tree limb. The skull shared much wisdom with Vasilisa and her pocket doll as the trio traveled and instructed Vasilisa that the trips of Baba Yaga were not yet complete. Do not let any touch me, for to touch me is a torturous death, warned the skull. You must not toss me aside either, but give me a proper burial so I can be at peace. Not even the fires of the dead are able to destroy the bones of those who wrong Baba Yaga. Only one who is a true innocent can end our suffering by returning us to the ground. However long have you been atop the Baba Yaga's fence? asked Vasilisa. I have no sense of time. I have been there ever since I desecrated a piece of land the Baba Yaga was responsible for, and she turned me into fire to cleanse others who were like me, answered the skull. And then he spoke no more. The forest was so dark in the pale winter light that Vasilisa only knew that the night had turned to day because she could make out the faint outlines of the trees as she walked between them. As they exited the forest and began to cross the steps, the winter sun dropped below the horizon in a fiery red display that left the snow appearing to burn as red as the skull's eyes. All night, the trio walked under thick clouds, and Vasilisa began to despair of ever getting home. Instead of giving up, she kept putting one foot in front of the other and planned out the barley stew she would make as soon as she arrived home with the coal to light the fire. Surprisingly, these thoughts helped the journey pass faster. Soon, Vasilisa saw her own familiar woods ahead, and as a faint light began to make itself known on the southern horizon, Vasilisa stepped into her beloved woods and was almost home. Meanwhile, the stepmother and stepsisters were recognizing the folly of letting the fire go out. With no fire, there was no way to melt the snow, and they were painfully thirsty. The stepmother had selfishly thought a neighbor would surely share their fire, but when the neighbors heard the stepmother had sent Vasilisa to the Baba Yaga to get a coal, they promptly turned their back on the woman and shut their doors. So the stepmother and her daughters were bundled up in her bed much as they had been when they sent Vasilisa away. Since the stepmother insisted on having the best of everything, including the best view out a window, she and her daughters saw the skull with fire coming out of its eyes the moment Vasilisa stepped out of the woods. They ran to the barricade, the door, to keep the skull outside, but their cold, frozen feet were nowhere near as nimble as Vasilisa's upon finally seeing her home. As Vasilisa approached the door to her home, the stepmother and stepsisters were running to slam down the crossbar. Vasilisa pushed open the door just in time, ready to announce she was back with coal to start the fire. As soon as the stepmother and her daughters looked into the fiery eyes of the skull, they burst into flames and burnt down to dust. The skull had tried to warn Vasilisa. After her initial shock, Vasilisa remembered what the skull had shared on their journey and swept up the ashes to scatter outside. Then 
she respectfully asked the skull to please start her kitchen fire. After enjoying a hot barley stew, Vasilisa walked the skull around the clearing in the woods and asked where it would like to be buried. The skull, grateful to finally be put to rest, warmed the ground so Vasilisa could dig the hole. And after the trio, Vasilisa, the doll, and the skull, poured the coal from the skull into the kitchen fire for safekeeping, they laid the skull to rest in a mound in the center of the clearing. The skull still gives thanks for the kindness of Vasilisa, the wisdom of the doll in her pocket, and the luck of escaping the Baba Yaga due to a mother's blessing. The kitchen fire never went out again, not even when it was banked to almost coolness in the summer, or when Vasilisa and her father traveled. And the fire never sent cinders into the house to leave holes in the rug or set the house ablaze. That spring, when Vasilisa's merchant father returned, his travels had been so lucrative, he told her it would be several years before he would need to travel again. The village all benefited from his prosperity and when he resumed his travels, he took his daughter with him for her wit and her wisdom, as well as her honeyed tongue that somehow always knew the right thing to say to make a situation better. And that, dear souls, is the story of Vasilisa. Anyone interested in a study guide around the story of Vasilisa, please join us on Blogger. The link is down in the comments. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening.